Kathleen. I'm a language scientist and I'm also a speech language pathologist. Today, I'm going to demonstrate an activity called speech detectives that I use to teach elementary, middle, and high school students about careers in language science, careers in speech language pathology, and about using the scientific method as a way to observe and describe patterns that we see in languages. Let's get started. So first I introduce the speech detectives activity. I say, this is my assistant, Billy. And when I'm working with younger children, I say, Billy says some words differently than I do. And our job is to be detectives. We're going to make some observations. We'll make hypotheses about why Billy says words the way he does. And then we'll test those hypotheses and revise them. For older students, I say that we are going to practice being speech language pathologists and doing the kinds of things SLPs do, which includes diagnosing speech and language disorders. And so we're going to diagnose Billy's speech sound production disorder by gathering some data on how he pronounces different words and looking for patterns in his mispronunciations. And regardless of the age group, I emphasize that our job as scientists is to make observations, come up with hypotheses to explain those observations, and then figure out what kind of information you would need to test the hypothesis. And that most of the time our hypotheses are wrong. And that's still a great learning opportunity. And it just means we have to revise the hypothesis, gather some more data and try again. So we then talk about if we wanna know how Billy says certain words, what are some ways we could figure out how he says words? So we're gonna do this by showing him some pictures and asking him to label them. So first we show him this picture of fuzz and we ask him to label what it is and he calls it fuss. So we're gonna keep that in our list. We'll keep all of our data in a list over here. So that first observation, that's a data point. Then I'm going to ask him about his friend Liz, but he calls her Liz. So let's add that to our list too. And then I ask him about the sound a bee makes and he says bus. He doesn't say buzz, he says bus. So let's add that to our list too. And then we pause here and I ask the students, okay, what's the pattern? What's the pattern in how Billy is pronouncing these words? And it's usually pretty easy for them to come up with that z is turning into the sound. And this can be a good reminder that we're talking about letters and not sounds. So if they say Z turns into S, we remind them we're talking about sounds. Um, and so it's also a great way to reinforce some of those phonics concepts, especially for younger students. Okay, so we put our hypothesis right up there and then we gather some more data. So I might ask them what kind of data they want. Sometimes older kids will know that all these Z sounds are at the ends of words. So maybe we should look at the beginning or middle. Um, so that's exactly what we do. So we say, oh, zap. How do you think he'll say zap? And students guess, he still says zap. Interesting. We might have predicted zap based on our hypothesis here. So let's add this to our list. How do you, this is his friend Lizzie. How do you think he'll pronounce Lizzie? He says Lizzie. Interesting. Okay. So let's add that to our list. And then finally, zoo. How do you think he'll pronounce zoo? He still says zoo, that's right. So let's add that to our list. Now it looks like we need to revise our hypothesis because this z turning into s is only part of the story. So the students are usually pretty quick to figure out that it only happens at the ends of words. So now our new hypothesis is that z turns into s, but only at the ends of words. Okay, so what's next? Well, here I say that we have this great hypothesis about the z sound, but there's a lot of other sounds in the English language. And so part of being scientists is that we want our hypotheses to be thorough and complete. So we wanna look at some other sounds too. So we're just gonna ask Billy to say some other words. How do you think Billy will pronounce mad? I mean, here we get a lot of different guesses from students. I might ask them why they made a certain guess. He says Matt. And so I like to affirm at this point that whatever their guesses were, they had really great reasons for those guesses. So even if they're wrong, that's okay. It's really awesome that they made a guess or a hypothesis. Um, and now we have some more information. So mad becomes Matt. What about bed? How do you think he'll pronounce bed? And they usually guess bet. So we add that to the list. How do you think he'll pronounce web? And here we usually get um, a number of different guesses or some students are um, just say they don't know, they wanna wait and find out what Billy says and Billy says web. Instead of web, he says web. So we add that to our list. And finally, we ask him about his friend, Bob. 
Um, and so I asked them to make a prediction about how Billy will say Bob and some kids suggest pop, some kids suggest bop um, and it's bop. So we add that to our list. So then we talk about the patterns again. And usually at this point, the kids have come up with three patterns that they observe. So we've got z turns into s, d turns into t, and b turns into p, but only at the ends of words. So this is a great start, I tell them, but we want to find one pattern that describes all three of these changes. So let's start by thinking about that z and s sound and how they're similar and how they're different. So we think of this sound like a snake and the z sound like a bee. I use the animal pictures to remind them we're talking about the sounds, not the way the letters are written uh, or spelling rules or anything. We're thinking about sounds right now. So I tell the students, say s and z and s and z and go back and forth to figure out how those sounds are similar and how they're different. What's your mouth doing? So I let them do that for a little bit. They usually come up with something like, Oh, and the z z sound, my tongue feels like it's moving. There's some kind of buzzing happening in my mouth or my tongue feels funny. Um, and they're also pretty good at noticing that other than that, their mouth is making the same shape for both sounds. And that's a great observation. So we talk about that a little bit more. We try to figure out where that buzzing is starting and it's coming from your larynx, your voice box right here in your throat. So if you say z, you can feel your throat vibrating, but if you say s, you don't feel anything. So some sounds like s are made with our voice box off. It's not vibrating, it's a voiceless sound. Sounds like z are made with our voice box on. It's a voiced sound. Your voice box is buzzing for those sounds. And with older children, I'm older students, I might get into some of the anatomy and physiology behind voice and voiceless sounds for elementary school students. I usually leave it at this unless there's questions. Um, Okay, so we figured out that there's voice and voiceless sounds. So we have we can have these pairs of sounds like s and z that are made with the same part of our mouth. So in this case, it's the tip of your tongue up behind your front teeth and you're pushing air out between your uh, teeth and your tongue. But they're different in terms of what your voice box is doing, whether it's on or off. So we can sort some more sounds into voiced and voiceless. So I like to do this by holding up my sound cards and I say, okay, we've got the d sound. Is your voice box on or off? It's on. So we put it here. Now that we've sorted the sounds into voiced and voiceless, we can come back to our original list and our three patterns that we found in Billy's speech and talk about whether we can think of one pattern that describes all three of these. So, so at this point, students can say that voice sounds become voiceless at the ends of words. So now instead of three patterns, we have one pattern. Thank you so much for joining me today to learn about our speech detectives activity. We would love to bring this and our other activities to your classroom for students anywhere from grades three through 12. If you'd like to learn more, check us out on Instagram at The Language Scientist or email us at info at We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you.